This episode sponsored by Incogni. Hello and welcome history buffs! My name is Nick Hodges and today we'll be exploring one of the biggest mysteries and culture phenomena of 17th century France. Based on the book by Alexandre Dumas, The Man in the Iron Mask is an exploration to King Louis XIV, the Musketeers, and a mysterious masked prisoner. In 1698, a prisoner was moved into the Bastille prison. He was described as a man who was always masked, and his name never pronounced. Moved from prison to prison, he never stayed in one place for too long. He was guarded by French musketeers, as he was brought to the Bastille where he was locked away and kept a secret from the world. The prisoner died in Bastille Prison in 1703, only five years after arriving. His clothes burned, the walls of his cell scraped down, washed, and left without a trace of his existence. His name never appeared in any records, and the death of this mysterious masked man captivated the nation. Just who was the mysterious man? Why was he hidden away? And why was his face covered by a mask? Stories of this man have made their way from history into fiction, the most famous of which came from a larger work from Alexandre Dumas, the victim of Bragelin ten years later, written in 1857. In it, we follow the story of four musketeers, D'Artagnan, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis, and their connection with the masked prisoner. This story has captured the hearts of readers and moviegoers ever since, including this 1998 interpretation. And over the course of this review, I'm going to go over the real history of the period and discuss the theories of who this person might have been. This is the Man in the Iron Mask. The Man in the Iron Mask takes place in 1662. During this time, France was undergoing a lot of change. A famine had struck the countryside as crops failed, and harvest came up short. Louis had only just come to power, and perhaps didn't know how to best handle the food shortage. I am a young king. But I am king. Known as the Sun King, Louis XIV was named King of France in 1643, although he didn't take over full control from his regent Cardinal Mazarin until 1661. He ruled as an absolute monarch, which is perhaps best explained by his own words, l'état c'est moi, or I am the state. He believed he had divine rights chosen directly by God to rule over the people of France. Louis ended up not dealing with the food crisis, and instead raised taxes over the peasantry to increase his treasury. Starved and angry, the peasants rebelled, as they often did in France due to massive social inequality, and in response, King Louis sent in the troops to repress the rebellion. In the 17th century, France had only three main social classes, the clergy, the nobility, and everyone else. Peasant, third social class. Parisian baker, third social class. Relatively rich merchant, but not landed aristocracy, third social class. As the clergy and nobility were exempt from paying taxes, this meant that the rest of the population were burdened to keep the crown afloat, and the ones who predictably hurt the most were the peasants, the poorest of the poor. To make matters worse, the clergy and nobility often banded together and used their influence to ensure nothing was ever resolved in the French Estat General, their version of Parliament or Congress. This blatant system of inequality did work in their favour for some time, but in the end they pushed things too far and tensions between the classes culminated in the French Revolution of 1789. If only the peasantry had been better looked after, then perhaps the whole thing might have been avoided. I know when I need someone to protect my interests, I turn to Incogni, the sponsor of today's video. Like the criminal elite of feudal France, there are equally nefarious figures in our society. I am of course talking about data brokers. These guys make it their mission to sell your personal information to the highest bidder. Ever get a telemarketing call and wonder, how on earth do these people get my number? Well, it's because they bought it from data brokers, who often acquire them from leaked hacks. And it's not just your number they're selling, it's also your name, your email, address, your contact information, and if enough data is gathered, then that can leave you vulnerable to the whims of whomever buys it. Whether it be companies who want to know your shopping habits, your employment history, your health information, or even someone who wishes to assume your identity. From there, the list only gets darker. Now you can request these brokers to delete your data yourself, but this can be extremely time consuming, and could take up to 66 years to finalize your data inquiry requests. Fortunately, the Incogni team can contact data brokers on your behalf and do all of this for you 
you, and you'll be stunned with how much they do. We can no longer wait for slow-moving governments to step in, and the lightning speed of the digital age is up to us to protect ourselves. If you wish to get started, all you need to do is click on the link in the description box below. The first 100 people who do so and enter the promo code HISTORYBUFFS will get 60% off their purchase. And now let's get back to the review. But why did Louis XIV need so much money from the peasants? Well, one of the reasons was to pay for his excessive partying. And I'm not talking about your average get-together, but some serious feasts at his Palace of Versailles outside the capital, Paris. The foundation of the Versailles Palace we know today was built by his father in the 1630s. Louis XIV fell in love with the palace and spent exorbitant amounts expanding it throughout his reign including the gardens that make it so distinctive and recognizable as a piece of French monumental architecture. According to his memoirs, the young king wanted a large palace with an infinite number of apartments to accommodate women, nobility, and whoever else resided in his court. Louis firmly believed that Versailles and his beautiful gardens were a perfect representation of his power, wealth, and strength. But living this life of luxury really distanced him from the struggles faced by his people. But as your advisors, we feel it is our... Our duty. Uh, yes, yes, our duty to inform you that there are riots in Paris. Riots? But Paris is the most beautiful city in the world. Why should my people feel anything but pride and contentment? Well, of course, Majesty, I'm sure they are content and proud, but they are also starving. As the film accurately portrays, King Louis really wasn't that concerned about the riots. If you look through his own memoirs, you would find barely any mention of them. However, a letter from the Archbishop Fenelon to the king proves that not only were the people starving and in rebellion, but that the king must have known about it. And I quote, Your peoples, whom you should love like your children, are starving. Cultivation of the land is almost abandoned in order to make and defend vain conquests abroad. Instead of drawing money from these poor people, we should give them alms and feed them. If the king, it is said, had the heart of a father for his people, would he not rather put his glory in giving them bread? Uprisings are becoming frequent. Even Paris, so close to you, is not exempt. Wow, that letter perfectly demonstrates King Louis' priorities. The movie absolutely nails his portrayal. Because what money he didn't blow on Versailles and lavish parties, Louis spent on costly wars with the Dutch and Spanish. Despite the famine back home, his troops could always count on being well fed. We have stocks on the wharves right now, don't we? We can distribute that. But, Majesty, that, that food is spoiling. That is why it was not sent to the army. Then you must hurry. What an excellent idea, Your Majesty. In the film, we see Louis planning his war against the Dutch, which did happen, but not in 1662. Louis' conflict with the Dutch started in 1672, a full 10 years after the movie. In fact, during this time, France would be fighting two conflicts to expand its territory, first against the Spanish and then later against the Dutch. In the territory above France, in what is now Belgium, the French, Spanish and Dutch all claimed some of these lands. Louis married Spanish princess Maria Theresa in 1660 with the intention of solving problems between their two nations. With a Spanish bride at his side, Louis claimed that the Spanish Netherlands, bordering France to the north, should be his land by marriage. This was known as the War of Devolution from 1667 to 1668. After defeating the Spanish, he threw an absolute banger of a party in Versailles to show off the French victory and power over his rivals. And then a few years later, in 1672, the French broke a treaty with the Dutch and steamrolled them, an event the Dutch called the Disaster Year, in order to take more land in modern-day Belgium. The attack will come at dawn. No, no. Do not underestimate the Dutch. These troops will be cut off here, so shift them here and here, and then we outnumber them there. The war ended with the French pulling out of the Dutch Republic to refocus on fighting the Spanish. But it was the beginning of a period of French expansion throughout Europe during Louis XIV's reign. So sorry, but the film got the timeline wrong. And while I'm at it, if the film is set in 1662, then where's his new queen Maria Theresa? All we saw was a bunch of his mistresses, but no mention of his queen. Overall, the film does do a good job of showing us Louis' arrogance, his lack of care towards the common folk, and his designs to grow France's power across Europe, even if they got the dates wrong and ignored his connections to Spain and his wife. But how did he maintain this power? How did he keep himself and his palace safe? Well, let's talk about the Musketeers. Alexandre Dumas became famous for writing stories about the Musketeers, an elite group of soldiers that served the King of France. 
The Musketeers were originally created by Louis XIII, Louis XIV's father, in 1622, and they weren't officially disbanded until well after the French Revolution in 1816. There were many Musketeers over the years, and four of them have been memorialised in Alexandre Dumas' works D'Artagnan, Athos, Porthos and Aramis. Alexandre Dumas first introduced these characters in his book The Three Musketeers in 1844, and like in his later book, The Man in the Iron Mask, Athos, Porthos and Aramis make up the traditional Three Musketeers, and D'Artagnan is introduced as a younger character that challenges our trio. And what's really great about Dumas as a writer and quasi-historian is that he weaves so well French history in his fiction, and I love me some good historical fiction, but were D'Artagnan and the Three Musketeers based on real-life Musketeers? Well, actually yes. Athos, played by John Malkovich, was based on Armand de Athos. The real Athos joined the Musketeers in 1640, but was killed in a duel in 1643. Revolution! Open war! Blood in the streets. Porthos, played by Gerard Depardieu, was based on Isaac de Porthau, and fun fact, the real Porthos and Athos were cousins. Porthos joined the Musketeers from 1642 to 1654, and out of all the Musketeers in the movie, Porthos is the womanizer, although he complains frequently of aches, pains, and generally being old. Stop praying and revel with me, Aramis. I need my spirits lift. I'm old, I'm weak, my strength is gone. Porthos. Mm. Aramis, played by Jeremy Irons, was based on Reed the Aramites. He served in the Musketeers from 1640 to 1648, and in the film he's a Jesuit priest, although in the books he's more of a womanizer like Porthos. Ah, Aramis. Your Majesty. You are a priest, but once you're a Musketeer, I, like my father before me, have trusted you with the gravest of missions. And finally, D'Artagnan, played by Gabriel Byrne, who was based on Charles de Bats de Casamor d'Artagnan. Although not in 1662, as the movie says, but from 1667 until his death at the siege of Maastricht in 1673. Look at the faces of these men. How they admire and fear you. With the great D'Artagnan watching over me, who in France would be possibly such a fool as to try and do me harm? A fool's blade can be sharper than his brain. By 1662, in the book, the film, and in real life, the only musketeer out of the four that was actively serving was D'Artagnan. So while the real Athos, Porthos, and Aramis served as musketeers at the same time, although briefly, the real D'Artagnan didn't join until much later, after all three men had left or died. In the film, Athos' son Raoul and his soon-to-be fiance Christine attend one of Louis's lavish parties. Raoul wants to follow in his father's footsteps and join the Musketeers, but King Louis sees Christine and decides he wants her as his mistress and sends Raoul to die on the front lines of battle. Distraught over the death of his son, Athos storms Versailles intent on killing the king. He's stopped by D'Artagnan and the two take different paths. Athos wants to see Louis gone and D'Artagnan is intent on serving the king and making him… nicer? All for one, one for all. You cannot ask me to betray my king. I have sworn an oath. When a king is dishonorable, you are removed from your oath of honor. An oath is an oath precisely because it cannot be removed. Why do you follow him, D'Artagnan? Why? What we fought for is greater than king or rank or reward. What do you fight for now? I fight for the belief that every man can be better. Even Louis. Splitting up from D'Artagnan, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis scheme a plot to replace the king with the man in the iron mask. The Man in the Iron Mask, a legendary story about a figure who, during King Louis's reign, was sent to prison and forced to live with his face covered by a mask. Except it wasn't an iron mask, but a black velvet one. But regardless, nobody knew what he looked like, and to this day his identity remains a mystery. Voltaire, the French philosopher who was born during Louis's reign, was one of the first to write about this mysterious figure, and popularised the idea that he wore an iron mask. In his book, The Age of Louis XIV, Voltaire wrote, and I quote, The Iron Mask was undoubtedly a brother, and an elder brother, of Louis XIV. For Voltaire, and later Dumas, the fact that the prisoner was hidden away and had his face covered meant that his face was the reason for his imprisonment, and who better to hide away than the brother of the king, a credible threat to Louis's power and control over France. You knew there was a man of such resemblance? He is my brother. Brother? My twin. My blood, a fact which has kept him alive until now. 
Fascinated by Voltaire's description of a man in an iron mask, even though it was wrong, Dumas wrote an essay speculating on his identity before writing his now famous novel. In reality, King Louis did have a brother named Philippe, but he wasn't a twin. Philippe was born in 1640, two years after his brother King Louis, and has a well-documented history as the Duke of Orleans. So who was the real guy if not a blood relative of Louis XIV? Although many potential candidates have been suggested, in 2016, Professor Paul Sonino at the University of California, Santa Barbara, claimed that after 30 years of research, he was sure that the real man in the Iron Mask was Eustache Daujeau. Daujeau worked for Cardinal Mazarin, who served as regent to King Louis XIV until Mazarin died and Louis came into power in 1661. It's thought that Cardinal Mazarin stole a sizable fortune from the King and Queen of England, a French ally at the time, and Daujeau blabbed about it. He was arrested and told that if he revealed his identity to anyone, he would be killed. Professor Sonino also argued that the real man in the iron mask, who was actually wearing a black velvet one, did not have to wear the mask permanently, only occasionally. Anyway, back to the movie Athos, Porthos and Aramis, breaking Louis' twin Philippe out of a prison island. This island was the Ile de Lorraine just off the coast of Cannes. And although the man in the iron mask was moved from prison to prison, including the famous Bastille prison, this is where he spent a decent amount of his sentence. Isolated and alone, the character Philippe spent six years in the prison until he smuggled out by hiding under Aramis's cloak. Well, I'm a genius, not an engineer. Aramis then switches Philippe with a strikingly similar corpse bought in the same mask and tells the jailer they should burn it because he likely has the plague. Don't ask me where he got the body, but in any case, they buy it. After Philippe is rescued from the prison, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis teach him how to act like his twin brother, the king. And the plan is to switch King Louis with Philippe at a masquerade ball and hide Louis away, and then France would have a proper king. We're offering you a chance to be king. No. You're offering me a chance to pretend to be king. A king that you hate. Not everyone hates him. Don't you? Why should I become him? Until you give me a reason, I won't do it. Philippe is right. We haven't given him a reason to do what we ask of him. Once I, once all of us believed in spending our lives in the service of something greater than ourselves. Aramis had his faith, Porthos his lust for life, D'Artagnan his devotion, and I had Raoul. But we all had a common dream that one day we would finally be able to serve a king worthy of the throne. It is what we dreamt, what we bled for, and what we have spent a lifetime waiting to see. Ultimately, their plan is thwarted by D'Artagnan, and in an attempt to flee Versailles, King Louis and D'Artagnan capture Philippe. Athos, Porthos, and Aramis don their old-school traditional musketeer outfits and go rescue Philippe from the Bastille prison. Meanwhile, D'Artagnan learns that Philippe is not just an imposter, but Louis' twin. And it's here that we learn that D'Artagnan is the father of the twins, as he's been in love with the Queen Mother for most of his life, and they had an affair almost 24 years ago. So that explains why he put up with King Louis being so awful this whole time. Faced with this new information, D'Artagnan decides to help his old friends rescue Philippe from the Bastille, reveals that he's the father of the twins, and dies protecting Philippe from Louis. And thus our film ends. Louis is imprisoned in the mask and Philippe gets to rule in his stead and becomes France's greatest king? The king known as Louis XIV brought his people food, prosperity, and peace, and is remembered as the greatest ruler in the history of his nation. Brought his people food, prosperity, and peace? I don't think so. In the years after 1662, there were more famines, more hunger riots, and more wars. His territorial expansion continued into the 18th century. Even taxation got worse. The absolute monarchy that Louis so boldly exemplified was so resented after his exploits that future King Louis XVI paid for it with his head. It's ludicrous. Overall, despite being based on historical fiction and taking more than a few liberties to make the story richer, The Man in the Iron Mask does give us a good insight into the life of the nobility in 17th century France, as well as the Musketeers. The legend of The Man in the Iron Mask lives on, immortalized in fiction and film forever. We feared the mask would destroy you. I wear the mask. It does not wear me. 
Well, that about wraps it up. Once again, thanks to today's sponsor, Incogni. Remember to click on the link in the description box below for your exclusive deal. My name is Nick Hodges, and thanks for watching History Buffs. And remember, if you like the show, help the channel grow. If you wish to support History Buffs, then you can now do so at Patreon. And as always, let me know in the comment section what you thought about the man in the iron mask. And of course, what historical movie should I review next? In the meantime, check out the History Buffs Twitter and Facebook page for new updates. Until then, I'll see you next time.